So last week we read through seven and eight of Hebrews. This week we'll at least get through nine and ten. Um, and the next week we'll we might have to consolidate a little bit just so that we can finish the book of Hebrews before Holy Week so that there's some closure for it since it won't be read after Pascha. Um, I think uh, Louisa and Big Harry, um, would you like to share some of what we went over last week, if you remember um, from chapter seven and eight? Oh, There's a... no grading for the quiz. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the Levite, uh, 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 we went over the. Uh, Drill down. <laughs> was it the Levi's father that uh, we talked about? They were the priestly class. They were the, the individuals that for generations carried over of the 12 uh, tribes of Israel, I'd imagine it was they. And that's a big part of what uh, we did talk about in chapters seven and eight. I don't recall all the detail. Uh, uh, well, very, very good. You, you, that, that is um, the chunk of what we, we spoke about. Um, and we, we discussed how Paul really went into depth about uh, the Levitic practice of the priesthood and this order of the mystical Melchizedek. Uh, he, he's now spent about three or four chapters of Hebrews really going over um, the, the depth of the, the royal priesthood, the priesthood that was traced back to Melchizedek, who he is saying has only been completed through um, the God-man who is Christ. And uh, this week we'll continue reading more about uh, some of the, uh, what can I say? Some of the um, liturgical practice that went into this priestly class having to do with the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies and how this this continuity uh, from this royal this um, not royal this this priestly class um, has been transcended over time and has been fulfilled only through Christ and that the new covenant this new sacrifice uh, is very different than what what the uh, the forebears the the previous order of the priesthood had been a part of um, and how. Uh, we spoke a little last week how this is no longer a matter of bloodline. It's not just those who are part of this quest, since it was from the tribe of Levi, uh, but rather this priesthood has been continued and, and made anew through Christ. And so even the priests today are, are not necessarily of the same order as Christ because Jesus was the sacrifice and offered the sacrifice. And only he was able to do this. But we do this, as we say in the divine liturgy, in remembrance of him. Uh, the Greek word is anamnesi. So we, we, we are connected through the Eucharistic celebration, but we're also remembering what he did for us and what took place. And so we have this, this juxtaposition of past, present, and even future because of the uh, impending uh, return of, of Christ and the kingdom in its uh, fulfillment. Um, which is why, as we've, we've spoken in the past, we don't necessarily follow in the church the normal chronology or chronos time, but the keros, the time that is that unto God, which does not follow the typical linear fashion uh, that we know in our everyday. Uh, so without further ado, uh, would anyone like to read? Sure, I'll start. All right, little Harry. <laughs> yeah, then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lamp stand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, 
and the tables of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things, we cannot now speak in detail. Okay. So just as a reminder, of course, St. Paul is writing to Jewish Christians who would have known, uh, at least from description, about this Holy of Holies. Um, if you look at Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, that's where we have the Leviticus, Leviticus, of course, has the name Levi in it. So in these books, we have the full establishment of um, the Holy of Holies. We have the Levitic priesthood. We have the practices that took place um, within this, uh, this temple and the veil. The veil, um, think of it kind of how the church is set up today, even though it's not exactly the same. The outer veil, you could consider like the narthex, where you walk in from outside. It's kind of a place to start, um, let's say, removing our, our cares from what, what was currently you know, in our minds from outside the church into the holy space, the, the nave. Uh, the nave is you know, the, the main portion of the church where all the pews are. And then you get the icon screen. And then you could consider, if, if you're thinking about how they would have had it set up, that's almost like the second veil. Um, it's a little different because now it's not just the high priest that enters, but it's um, the clergy, people who are doing some type of task, whether they're, they're cleaning or you know, fixing the cloths or helping with the service. So that's a little different, but it, it kind of follows that structure. And so this second veil um, would have kept out all of those who were assisting the high priest, the other priests and those who were serving. Think of it like if just the bishop went back uh, behind the altar and the priest and the deacons and, and the altar servers were kind of kept away um, in order to perform the sacrifice. And so this is the place of the high priest where this tabernacle was kept. Even on our altars now, we have a tabernacle. And this keeps the reserve Eucharist from, uh, which will prepare uh, in just a few weeks on Holy Thursday, because we commemorate the institution of the Eucharist. A, a, a second lamb is prepared and it's dried out. And then it's kept in the tabernacle. Should we need it to visit people who are sick at home or in the hospital, that's where we get the reserve. And we take the little crumbs it typically goes through a little process where it dries out in the air and then it's baked so it becomes very crumbly and then it's broken into pieces and kept so that we can just put it on the spoon and, and give it uh, for a communion to someone who needs a visitation. And so that typically brings us to the next year. We can always prepare another one during the year should we need it, but you can get a, a, a lot of use out of the one, one piece when it becomes crumbs. And so now we can consider this showbread. Um, but in, in this tabernacle, uh, which um, was said here, it had a few items and all of them have significance. Uh, of course, it was gold laden, which is a pure metal. Uh, that's why most of what we use in the church are pure metals. Um, part of it is because it's, they're beautiful, they're ornate, but also in a practical sense, with these pure metals, they're not porous. And so the, the Eucharist does not get seeped in and we don't use a wooden chalice or even types of glass. We use something that's metal that does not rust or decay and it's able to easily um, be cleansed, let's say of, of any, any remaining uh, gifts so that they're not just sitting. Uh, let's see. Okay, the manna. The manna is what fell from heaven. Uh, we read about this in Exodus when um, the Israelites had left Egypt and they were wandering in a desert and Moses had inter uh, prayed for God's intercession to take care of the people who were hungry and manna fell from heaven. And so part of what is in this reserve, kind of like how we have, is the manna. We have Aaron's rod that budded. Uh, this was actually seen as a a prophecy of the Theotokos and her um, conception. And there are some 
Orthodox churches that have um, icons that have the different prophecies from the Old Testament. And one of them is the, the rod that budded uh, because it, it's very strange that this, this dead stick, let's say, something that could not produce a flower or fruit, budded. Um, so this is a, let's say, a foreshadowing of the Theotokos giving birth to Christ. And the tablets of the covenant, of course, these are the Ten Commandments. Um, they were stored, and this was part of this Ark of the Covenant. And so this would be, let's say, um, processed from place to place. And kind of like how we do on Holy Friday with the Kavuklion and the Epitaphion, and we process it, and then it's established somewhere. That's what would have happened when they moved from place to place. They would have had you know, the tents, the, the ark, the instruments, whatever was used for the sacrifice um, and for the liturgical practice transported. Each person had their role in doing this, and then it would be set up. And we had these holy objects, similar to how, like I said, we have the tabernacle. Sometimes there are relics in the church. Um, or, of course, we have the icons. And all of these become instruments within our use in the divine liturgy and worship. Um, of course, even we sing about the cherubim um, being at the throne of God. We have the cherubim before the great entrance. There are many prayers um, throughout the liturgy that include the cherubim and the seraphim. And this mercy seat, this mercy seat was believed to be kind of the symbolic seat in which God bestowed mercy on the people. And this mercy would come uh, in the form of the high priest offering the sacrifice, um, typically on Yom Kippur, let's say the Day of Atonement, which is still one of the high holy days for the Jewish community. Um, and this would be a place where everyone's sins would be atoned for and given this mercy. Um, and there would actually be this, this goat that was believed to have had all the sins and, of the people cast into as a form of atonement. And the goat would be left led off as a sacrifice of a cliff. And that's actually where we get the modern saying, a scapegoat. And so this scapegoat took on the sins of the people and was an offering. But there were other animal offerings that took place. And this would be on behalf of the high priest for all the people. And unlike the high priest, meaning Jesus Christ, um, that offered a perfect gift, a bloodless sacrifice, uh, which we continue to do each and every time we celebrate the liturgy, they would often have to sacrifice different animals and repeat this process throughout the year for atonement of sins. And so that's another sign of the transformation that took place within um, the, the sacrifice. We'll, we'll get to that a little farther along um, as we speak about sacrifices a little more and uh, the blood of us offering of the Eucharist. So please continue unless anyone has any questions. Limitations of the earthly service. <clears throat> now, when these things had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Concerning only, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and freshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, there's a lot of significance, of course, in this paragraph, but um, a few little points to highlight. Uh, one, he says, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. Now, 
a major difference here is that um, our pre-communion prayer even talks about in in sins voluntary involuntary in word indeed known or unknown so we have now an offering that is made even for sins that we know about that we know we committed some that we even knew in the time in the moment that we were committing and so this isn't just under a, a particular set of criteria um, but this has been expanded to be all inclusive and then we move along um, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. So he's saying these things were good and this, this site was holy and, and it contained holy items, um, the rod of Aaron, the manna, the, the um, commandments, but even this was not the completion. And the completion now, the Holy of Holies, is with the Eucharist, having to do with the sacrifice of Christ. And then he gets to this point, offer which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings, fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. You could, <laughs> I almost read this as a little jeb that St. Paul is giving to uh, the Jewish Christian community because he's saying, in the old days, uh, and even for you, maybe some of you who grew up Jewish, of course, because they were recent converts to Christianity or follow, being followers of the way, um, this was this was how they engaged their relationship with God and their religious practice. There was a major concern with food and drink. We hear St. Paul speak about this numerous occasions where um, even when he's he's in Greece and he's talking about food offered to idols. And unless it becomes a stumbling block for your brother or your sister, it's no longer something that you need to be concerned about because it's not that there are clean foods and unclean foods. Uh, of course, even uh, for the Jews today, there are unclean foods, um, having certain types of, of uh, let's say, pork, um, meat and cheese together if they're keeping kosher, certain types of um, shellfish. And so we see that this has carried through the time, through the, the millennium. But St. Paul is saying, you know, they, there was a concern just about food and drink and various washings, meaning ritual purity, um, who is clean to enter into the temple. Um, even today, some of our practices, which we have in the church, you know, grew up alongside of the Jewish practice, like the 40 day blessing. We even have the, the celebration on February 2nd where Jesus was brought into the temple because this was also a Jewish custom. Um, interestingly enough, um, even in the Coptic church today, you know, in Egypt, um, it's 40 days for uh, a new baby boy and 80 days for a new baby girl. And so some of these concepts of ritual purity or impurity um, have kind of crept into Christianity in different denominations. Uh, there's, there's more to that. It's not just a matter of, let's say, the woman being impure, but it, there was a kind of a spin of, well, the woman is, let's say, more pure than the male because she's able to be the, the conveyor of a new life. And so um, in her times of being, uh, let's say, able to become pregnant, she's at a, a holier place than the male. And so after giving birth, there's a period where she's unable to. And so it's almost like a descent from that. Again, this is not Christian uh, by nature. Now I like to say that um, we encourage the 40 days before the mom and the baby come to church because she's tired and needs rest. <laughs> you know, it, it's I, Now I think it's just a matter of practicality, giving her time to get back to feeling better um, bonding with the baby. The baby needs to build some type of um, immunity and comfort in the world. Then it's, it's a lot to come to church and to be processed around. So there's that. And then the fleshly ordinances. Primarily, this is speaking about circumcision. The circumcision, of course, was something that the early Christians really struggled with because they still thought that they needed to complete the law the way that it was 
um, that it was practiced before the time of Christ. And St. Paul, uh, as we've spoken, as a good Pharisee, um, who kind of learned his lesson the hard way, um, encouraged him to not, not feel like they need to comply with some of these older customs. That it's no longer the way to have this covenant, this share in the covenant with God, that there's a new way. Um, so that's that. <laughs> um, someone else like to take the take a turn? We'll, we'll change I'll read. It up. All right, Sarah. The heavenly sanctuary. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, uh, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Thank you. Of course, Christ's own body became the new tabernacle. And he became the sacrifice which was uh, essentially housed within this, this holy of holies. Um, interestingly enough, um, in, many, um, in many hymns in the church, uh, the Theotokos is known as the, like the, the golden or red, red heifer, like this, this special um, heifer. And you might think, oh, what, why is that? But it's because... Um, this type of, of heifer was, I think, was known for giving birth to a male calf and was seen as a spotless, um, what can I say, as a, a, or a, a spotless heifer uh, and was actually used, I believe, for the sacrifice in the Holy of Holies. And so this, this degree of purity becoming the, the um, place of sacrifice. And so then we have uh, a reference, the first reference that we'll get to about blood, meaning if, if we have these animals, which are not, um, let's say, uh, or the sprinkling the unclean, so the, the blood from these animals helping to cleanse or make pure um, these earthly, earthly things, how much more this blood of Christ that is from the blameless one, the blameless lamb, uh, the sinless one, uh, this, this, this sacrifice that he offered can't even be compared to previous sacrifice because this is the God man. And so there's, there's a, a divinity to this sacrifice that did not exist before him. Um, so he, as the meteor, the new covenant, of course, his covenant that he made with us, which we recite during the divine liturgy. Remember, this is my blood of the new covenant. And this reference to blood, which we'll get into a little farther uh, along, um, blood was used as a way in the temple sacrifice as an offering to give part of life, you know, the actual lifeblood of animals um, as a sacrifice to God. But here, this blood was, let's say, not, um, it's not sacrificed in the same way. But this is a sign of the covenant, the covenant that we have through Christ, through partaking in his own body and blood. Well, why don't you take one more paragraph? Okay. The mediator's death necessary. For where there is a testament, there must also of, necess of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in forth is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water 
scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people saying this is the blood of the covenant which god has commanded you then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry and according to the law almost all things are purified with blood mm. and without the shedding of blood there is no remission so because of this and jesus being a, a good jew of course um knew that in order to transform this old sacrifice his own blood in this sense would be part of this remembrance each time we took uh, uh took part in the eucharistic assembly and so as saint paul says purify your blood and without shedding of blood there is no remission however we have the remission of sins without the shedding of blood because he, he offered himself once and for all we didn't need to perform these sacrifices of old um and there was just one more thing i wanted to ah up here i'm reminded for moses um, put a calves and goats with water scarlet wool and hyssop um, i'm reminded of psalm 50 where, where we hear about um Show, uh, you shall wash me with hyssop and I shall be made clean. Hyssop is part of, um, uh, it's, a nice, it's a nice fragrance. <laughs> so hyssop is sometimes used even um, in incense um, or used, you know, we have the sprinkling of the, the holy water, not the holy water, the, the rose water that we use um, on the epitaphion. These are some liturgical items that we still use. Uh, but also in Psalm 50, we hear about how um, the sacrifice unto God is a contrite heart and our spirit is offered to God. It's not necessarily these whole burnt offerings. And this comes from David's mouth. Um, of course, the psalm is out of repentance, but it's that we bring ourselves to God as the sacrifice. We don't need to partake in these other things. We are good enough to bring. Um, and our struggles, we bring our our whole heart to God. Um, and this is all that he has for us to be open and honest about our, our lives, our joys, our sadness, our anxieties, our frustrations. And this in and of itself becomes a way to sacrifice what we have. And our, our pride, of course, is, is something to sacrifice and kind of attain that humility uh, without being aware of it, because then it doesn't really become humility. But <laughs> but I digress. Um, any questions so far? Is, is all of this uh, a little more tangible than the past couple of weeks, let's say, with this Melchizedek uh, talk, and now it's a little more practical? And Father, I, I noticed one thing um, in the paragraph before, I think, where it said that um, the sacrifices of the animals was just to purify the flesh. Mm. But Christ's sacrifice actually purify our conscience. Yes. So kind of, I don't know, that just really struck me. A absolutely. It's, it's a very holistic um, cleansing of, mm -hmm. of, of body and soul um, with, with this, this constant remission of our sins. Every time we partake in the Eucharist, we believe that our sins have been... Um, have forgiven that you know even though of course confession is an, an important part of our tradition holy unction is an important part of our tradition for healing a body and soul every time we partake in the eucharist it is for this remission um and and healing of our ourselves oh did we lose harry oh there he is well good catch <laughs> um harry louisa do you want to take over for the last paragraph do you want it, Louisa, or you want me? It's up to you. Looks you like you're pointing in, Harry. Is you pointing to me? Okay. Yep. Greatness of Christ's sacrifice. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves were better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, 
not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifices of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Mm. So now we have a little bit of a, a catechism that he's offering saying, mm. first off, um, Jesus didn't enter the same Holy of Holies because he actually entered into the kingdom of God. So this was the type of sacrifice that was um, delivered up to God by the God man. And then he says, if, if it had been like these old sacrifices, he would have had to continue suffering either on a yearly basis or, or just a, a continuous basis since the beginning of time. But because of the nature of the sacrifice, he just had to do it once and it was complete. Um, and for those who are waiting this second coming, it will not be another form of sacrifice. He won't have to undergo any form of torture or suffering or, or life and death situation, but rather he is coming just for salvation to, to of course, um, with the second coming, there will be the, the discernment of, of those who have uh, kind of lived according to the, the precepts we have been given um, and this, this judgment that with, within the second coming. But oftentimes, even now, unfortunately, we talk about the second coming um, as if it's doomsday. And we hear in popular culture, I saw something the other day that reminded me of 2012 when there was... Um, especially in, in, uh, when I was living in, in Brooklyn or traveling the train to Manhattan, you'd see the signs everywhere, different stations uh, in the subway and people would be saying you know, this time and this date and they'd be handing out literature and all different languages to get people to prepare, which I mean, I think if you ever picked up the Bible, you would know from Jesus' mouth that he said, no one knows the time or the place, only the Father. So anyway, everyone can have their own interpretation, I guess. But even if we talk about, uh, in popular culture, the Antichrist, first off, we hear in, in the New Testament, we hear in St. Peter's letters, um, yeah, primarily St. Peter, Saint, uh, I think in St. James, also in St. Paul, this, this talk about those who are Antichrists or, or other, um, you know, false teachers, those who are leading the church early communities into heresy, who are divisive, who are even practicing magic and trying to you know, hone the spirit, let's say. Um, so all of these people, and we have antichrists around us, which is anyone looking to take people away from Christ. It's not this ominous figure. Um, and and again, the, the end times are not scary. They're Christ. So if, if we are trying to do our best in this life, it shouldn't be something that should keep us up at night or terrify us. Um, unfortunately, you know, we have a society that you know, lives rather distant from God in many ways. And so there's a lot of reasons to be concerned, I guess. You know, you see these horrible movies of all kinds of atrocities happening as being the end times and evil running rampant. But for us, it, it, it should be a sign of hope and of joy and if we're doing what we need to do, then we shouldn't be too scared. I'm not saying we need to rush towards it and look to end our, you know, end our time here sooner. But you know, if 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 Christ came back tomorrow, then I think that'd be pretty good for all of us. Um, all right, you know, Harry, why don't you take another paragraph or two? Okay, uh, animal sacrifices insufficient. Uh, this is chapter 10. Yes. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things, 
can level with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Mm. Christ's death fulfills God's will. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. Mm. So here we have a little uh, quote from Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet um, before the Babylonian captivity in Judah. Um, so he came after Isaiah, the prophet, who was also prophesying towards Judah because Jerusalem was already under the Assyrians. Um, and so Jeremiah is, you know, kind of telling the people a little bit of what is to come. And he, he, of course, prophesies, um, the coming of Christ. Now, granted, this was separated by about 560 to 600 years. Um, he's, he's still trying to give hope to the, to the, the people of Judah, because when the, Babylonians came and there was a captivity for uh, a couple of decades. I forgot the exact number of years, but um, it really impacted the, the faith and the uh, practice of the people. And so, um, why am I saying this? Uh, I lost my train of thought. It's that time of night. <laughs> uh, it'll, it, if it comes back to me, I will interject. I'm sorry about that. Harry, you want to continue? Yes. Uh, previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that will, he, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Mm. Right. So this is what we were speaking about before, with how the, um, the sacrifice of the these animals did not fully connect the people to God because it didn't fully remove their sin. It was a continuous offering. Um, and that in order to, to establish the, the Eucharist and the partaking of Christ's body and blood, the old had to be done away with, for lack of better words. Even in the, Saint, uh, the first chapter of his letter to the Hebrews, um, St. Paul was speaking about how over time, these older practices kind of fade until they're no longer in use. And that this isn't fully a bad thing because it wasn't as if they faded and there was nothing else to continue. They faded in order to give way to that which is new. Think of it how after a fire, um, you know, fire in the woods, everything is charred, burnt, there's death. But then the ground becomes incredibly fertile and new plants and vegetation come, animals come back. And so this is kind of what it was like for these old practices to fade for the uh, Jewish Christians in order to give way to a truly life-giving practice um, founded by Christ. And you, you could almost think, you know, what a relief they felt. Instead of having to comply with these 613 commandments, instead of having to only have some people who could 
be deemed worthy of participating in the procession of uh, the Ark of the Covenant and the tents and this and that. Uh, th this was now more inclusive. And that's exactly what the church is. The church is, is an inclusive body um, because Jesus didn't discriminate. He didn't say, well, I came for the, this group and that for that group, um, this age and that age. You know, it, it, there was no... Um, there's no separation. And, and this was also part of the practice before Jesus, that it, it was really focused around one particular group um, who was part of the liturgical life in, in, the, um, in ancient Israel. Uh, and it was almost as if it wasn't really on behalf of all the people since, the, since all the people weren't part of this. And so even that has been transformed. Uh, here we go. And every priest. Yes. Just a quick question, Father. So the, the Sanhedrin, uh, uh, would it not have been, uh, would it have been a select group of individuals that had ministry uh, given to them? Or would it have been open for even the most common and poorest of individuals? No, it, 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 it was the, the former. It was certainly... Uh, an elect. Okay, that's uh, what I thought. Yeah. Elders, yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you, Father. Yeah, we have something, not exactly the same, but we do have spiritual court in the Orthodox Church, but th this is typically for matters of um, if there's issues with particular clergy, then a spiritual court is comprised of um, often bishops, but sometimes priests, uh, depending on the issue, to kind of hear, almost like a regular court, to kind of hear the um, the case of, of the clergyman who's, who's having some issues. And then even if someone um, is to get divorced, there's a spiritual court, um, usually two priests, um, sometimes more, who just hear the person out. Typically by then they've already received um, a civil divorce. Um, and just to kind of explain what's going on and, and then uh, the church is able to grant an ecclesiastical divorce. And, and unless there's very odd circumstances that preclude that, um, not exactly like the, he, the Sanhedrin, but you know, there is this, this type of assembly that's put together for uh, particular occurrences in the church. Thank you, Father. Sure. Verse 11. Uh, 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 and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Hmm. Any thoughts about that? Uh, uh, did you want me to continue? Oh no, anyone have any thoughts uh, oh. about the last two paragraphs in a little more? It's almost, it's saying that it feels like you're saying that there are no sins in the past. Like once you've um, had the laws written into your heart, then whatever happened in the past is no longer to be remembered. Is that right? It, it, I... This is really a, a full renewal. Um, and you know, it's funny for centuries, um, you know, after the church was established, 
typically adults were baptized. And uh, even St. Constantine held off on baptism until the very end so that he would have this full remission of sins. Um, you can almost think as if he was kind of cheating, but uh, nonetheless, this, this belief that we have that, that not only is baptism wiping the slate clean, uh, which you could think, well, why does a baby really need that? But part of this is that, you know, in, in being baptized as a baby, we're able to begin our lives in the fullness of the church from when we're the, the smallest age. Um, and yes, even though we don't necessarily make this, uh, this choice, we are entrusted to our parents from the time we're born and our godparents to make this choice for us. And th this developed over time because um, man, practicality, you know, and, and there was a, a great part of history where uh, oftentimes babies would not live past a certain age or there was sickness and epidemics and uh, healthcare really, I mean, even in parts of the world today, this is more common than that, unfortunately, uh, very sadly, actually. And so to be baptized as the baby being brought into the fullness of the church, um, as Jesus had uh, commanded his, the, uh, compelled his disciples in Matthew 28, go therefore and um, baptize all nations <laughs> in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is an entry into that. So you're, you're right in that, um, when there is this remission first from baptism and then each time we participate in the Eucharist it, it's not as if there's a ledger that, that God is using saying oh well you know on, on uh, April 14th 2021 you did this and that we believe that our sins are remitted and <laughs> released from us um, and, and incidentally in Greek it's not the verb to forgive as we've spoken about it's to release and so as these sins are released from us over time, um, we believe that there, there isn't this baggage that we're carrying around. Sure, if we do the same thing over and over again, well, maybe that builds up. But um, instead of having to undergo the same, the same severity, let's say, of the sacrifice in order to remit these sins, because they didn't have what we have. And we, we have the, the gift of being you know, here 2,000 years after Christ that we are able to participate in the Eucharist the way that we are in the other sacraments in the church uh, with this constant remission of sins. And so in many ways, we're much more advantaged than or privileged than the, the early church. Hold fast your confession. Louise, are you up to reading tonight? I lost connection a little bit for a little bit so oh, okay. hopefully it won't it's been stable for a while so okay. hopefully it won't happen again but just in case therefore brethren having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of jesus by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of god let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the, the more as you see the day approaching. Mm. He writes long sentences. Yeah, run on, he'd be, <laughs> he'd be yelled at, especially in, in grammar school. Um, now, to stir up love and good works, this is something that St. James really talks about in his epistle, but not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. So this, this exhortation to continue collective worship, collective prayer, collective sacrifice within the liturgy is very important. Sometimes... Um, you may hear, well, why do I need to go to church? I can pray with God at home. Okay. I mean, if, you know, before I was ordained, if I didn't go to church on Sunday, I don't know necessarily if I committed the same time to, to prayer as if I had gone to church. 
um, it, you know, just helps to be in the right place for the right thing. You know, you go to school to learn, you go to work to do work. Nowadays, we're all home in many respects, but there's a, a place for these things because it, it helps to contrive the environment. Um, and, and even within the divine liturgy, I had a dogmatics professor, um, dogmatics, just fancy word for, you know, the teaching, the church, church dogma or doctrine and these fundamental teachings of our faith, um, who used to say that it is against the liturgy actually to do something more of, let's say, an, a um, private prayer during the divine liturgy. In other words, sometimes you would see people with the, the kumboskini, the prayer rope, and they'd be flipping it for the Jesus prayer during the liturgy. Uh, you see this more in, in the monastic uh, locations, but even at the seminary, you would see it or in some uh, parishes throughout the archdiocese. And you would say that this is, even though that's good in and of itself, it is disconnective in the sense of it is breaking the corporal prayer. And so when we are in the divine liturgy, we are not supposed to be off doing our own thing. We are supposed to be doing this together. Um, and that's the purpose of it. That's why we come together for the liturgy. It's not just a private act. Um, and it's not holier to do something on your own, but rather to be fully involved in the communal worship. Uh, there's one other thing. And then just here, you know, water is very important in, in um, our church. Not only is water the source of life but we have water for baptism we have water uh, through the the blessing of the holy water that we use to uh, you know, sanctify our homes and our, our bodies we drink the holy water um, we commemorate the holy or the water that came out of christ's side each time i i prepare um uh before the divine liturgy the wine is put in the chalice, but also water is too, as we remember the, the blood and water that came out of the side. Um, so that's that. And it's, of course, used for, uh, even to this day in the Jewish tradition, um, ritual purity. And even for women, there is a, a ritual bath that is is um, is used for, for kind of cleansing, for... Um, re-entering the temple and anyway that's it's not our practice but it shows the importance of water interestingly enough one time i was driving and i i was listening to an irish program on the radio and um apparently the the word for whiskey comes from a gaelic word ishkabaha which means water of life and so I, I, I used that for a, a sermon, actually, I had to do in Greek class about how, well, we have a water of life. It's, it's a different type of spirit, um, but this is our, our, our baptism. So I guess both animate people in different ways. All right. Do you want to continue, Louisa? For if we sin willful, willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. So there's the thing. Once people are, are brought into the fullness of the faith, once they have understood that there's this remission of sins, that there is a new way of um, living out our faith, then, you know, they're, they're almost in a worse place than those who didn't know uh, the gravity of what they were entering into. So if they continue with their ways as if they had not become a Christian, had not participated in the sacraments, well, it almost would have been better off if they didn't. Because now that they have this knowledge, it's, it's like doubly worse. Um, okay. Uh, anyone who's re uh, right? I mean, anyone who rejected Moses? And anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will be he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the spirit of grace? 
for we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, said the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Mm. Right. So anyone who understands the significance of um, Christ's sacrifice, of the Eucharist, of, of these practices in the church, um, and here we see insult to the spirit of grace, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, even Jesus said is, is a sin that uh, cannot be forgiven. So it, it's this, this willing willingness to defy um, the precepts, willingness to go against um, God, to separate ourselves. And it's a choice, you know, it, it's a relationship that we have. Again, it's not imposed. So there may be people who come into the fullness of the faith uh, who are exposed to these things, know what the truth is, and turn from it. And there's nothing that really we can do. Um, we can pray for people, but it, it's a choice. We can't force people to to follow this. All we can do is make sure that we're doing our best at, at doing so. Uh, but recall the former days. But recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you, had, had, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourself in heaven. Uh, this is a, a little reference. Uh, the illumination is baptism, endured great struggle with sufferings. Those who had become Christians in the early days after Christ um, had already started to experience, um, uh, what can I say, martyrdom, starting with St. Stephen, persecution. This persecution continued for hundreds of years under the Roman Empire. Um, and oftentimes, St. Paul writes to different communities to give them encouragement to not give up. St. Peter, in his letters, don't give up against the persecution in Antioch. Um, St. Paul was imprisoned a few times. And so um, this reference to him and his chains, he was imprisoned in Rome uh, at least twice. So uh, let's see. He's saying... We have a need of endurance. Um, after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. So he's saying, don't give up. <laughs> Just very simply, you, you, you know what's in store for you. I understand that you have endured some of these awful things, um, but know that you are storing up treasures in heaven. Of course, it's easier said than done because when we're actually the ones suffering, whatever it may be, um, only we know sometimes or those around us or God knows at least what, what we experience on a daily basis. It is pretty easy sometimes to want to throw in the towel. Um, <laughs> so I know from personal experience, you know, sometimes you have it, you have it in your hand and, you know, there's the, the coin you want to just chuck it in. Um, but he's saying, even though this may come to a point in your life that you feel this way, Keep the faith. Uh, like this past Sunday, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Sometimes that's all we can utter. Uh, even if not, God understands our hearts. So we may not always have the prayer or the words to ask for what we need in any given moment. Um, you want to just take it home for yet a little while? For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. We are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Mm. Yeah, and th this word perdition is interesting. In Greek, it's asotos, which is, of course, um, the way that, uh, actually, no, that, that's the prodigal, but the prodigal is said to have been living kind of in this, this life leading to perdition, which is kind of a hopeless sense and um, living in a way that kind of completely condemns the person uh, or damns the person just because there's a, a full turning away um, from that which is good and that which is blessed and, and kind of leading just in a life that 
is not really after anything positive. Um, so he's reminding them we're not we're not the type now that we have have seen the the uh, what do we say at the end of the divine liturgy we have um, found the true faith we have seen the light we have found the true faith. Uh, what is it in Greek? No, we have seen the true light. There's a little joke. <laughs> we have seen the, the electric light. Anyway, that's uh, humor for this time of day. So he's saying you, you can't turn back as if you don't know these things anymore. As he said in the beginning of the chapter, now that you've had a, a taste, a foretaste of the kingdom, um, you can't go, you can't revert back to your olden ways, whatever they were, whether they were Jewish, they were pagan, they were practicing one of these Greco Roman faiths. He's saying, no, 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 this, this, this is no longer the way you can revert back to because we are part of those who believe in the saving of our souls, which is only completed through Christ. Um, so, what do you think? I wrote these chapters myself. <laughs> Now, St. Paul, I, I like him. You know, Hebrews is a little more dense. It's not as straightforward as some of his other letters, which we'll get to, but um, there's a lot to it. I, I think it's a good Lenten read, which is why it, it, I believe is read during Lent, and that it really gets us thinking, just thinking about our faith, thinking about our, our choices, um, thinking about the, the ultimate sacrifice that Christ made on our behalf. Um, Father Philip, in this version that you're using, um, what's the significance of the italicized words? Is it um, translation? Or? That's a good question. I, I actually don't know why they're italicized here. Um, in the Greek, they're not. Um, I, I think it's it's a, a preferential thing. Um, I really don't know why, why they're used here. Yeah. All I know is in, in the Greek, we don't see a lot of what we see in some of the English translations. We don't see the same capitalizations, uh, which is common, um, and especially in the biblical Greek, but some of these other uh, little nuances we don't have. Father, when was this written? Uh, this, it's believed that this was written in around 68 AD. Uh, give or take. Um, and it, it's interesting because the destruction of the temple took place just about two years after this. Um, so pretty much everything he's, <laughs> everything he's talking to them about becomes null and void uh, in two years. Because without the, I don't mean to laugh, it's just iron, you know, uh, uh, what I say, hindsight is twenty twenty. So looking at what St. Paul was saying, this, this concept even of temple sacrifice was no longer possible for the Jews two years later. And so that's why it became more of this rabbinic Judaism having to do with the teachers uh, of, of the law, the, the Talmud, um, which is similar to let's say like our, our holy tradition um, and you know oral tradition and teachings within the faith um, because they could no longer offer the the temple sacrifice because the temple the temple had been destroyed mm. and it's of course now built upon as we said in the beginning um by the the dome of the rock which is a sacred site for for muslims um and so they had to permanently change their practice mm. that's why in a sense even though we've borrowed many customs from the jews um because at that point, after 70 AD, they had to really uh, not even refine, um, kind of build up uh, their their tradition again, or their, their way of actually practicing their faith. We grew up more like brother and sister, um, you know, almost helping to influence each other in different parts of the world and throughout the millennia, uh, because we're really just about 40 years apart with how the Christian church started after Jesus from 33 and then the new Jewish tradition after 70 AD. So we're not that different. Mm -hmm. 
other I believe was St. Paul's last letter. Um, yeah, I think this was. There's there's some um, discrepancy in uh, in the academic world of whether this was St. Paul or a disciple of Paul. Um, and we see this with a few other letters, like the letters of St. John. Uh, it's pretty much confirmed that we know he wrote the first two. The third, eh, we're not sure, but it sounds enough like him, and we believe that this is. Uh, in the Orthodox Church, this is attribute, fully attributed to Paul. Um, in the Catholic Church, there's a little more skepticism. I'm not too sure in the Protestant denominations how this is seen, but we're trusting that this is Paul. Any other questions? Yes. Um, they were talking about the sacrifice of the goats and the um, cows. So where what is the significance then of Jesus being the lamb? Where did the sacrifice of the lambs come in? Um, we have a reference to that in the Psalms. Um, Psalm 118, uh, if you have the, the full Orthodox study Bible that has the Old Testament, it'll, it'll be 118. Um, in Greek, it's known as the amomos, which is the blameless one. And this, it's, it's the longest psalm in the Psalter, uh, but this is attributed to kind of being a, a foreshadowing of Christ and his sacrifice. And we actually have snippets of this um, that are used during the uh, the Evlogitaria for um, Sunday mornings, but also for uh, the Friday around the time of the, uh, before we do the Lamentations and for funerals too. This comes from different parts of uh, Psalm 118. And so that's when we really hear about the lamb. Isaiah talks about the lamb. Um, and if you read Isaiah, there, there's quite a few references that, talk about Christ's uh, passion and crucifixion. Yeah. So was there a significance though to a lamb over a goat or? Um, well, also if we look back to Exodus um, and the, the blood of the lamb being sp spread okay. for the Passover, um, Jesus as the, as the lamb for Passover, um, there's that connection too. That makes sense. Yeah. Anything else? Well, I'm glad it's nice to see the, the four of you. So thank you for joining tonight. Next week we'll wrap up um, Hebrews, God willing, and then we'll be together, hopefully, uh, whichever you're able to come for Holy Week, the week after. Mm -hmm. So. We'll celebrate unction instead of uh, Bible study in two weeks. <laughs>